Hello! Welcome to Slate Money, your guide to the business and finance news of the week. I'm Felix Salmon of Axios with Elizabeth Spires of New York Times. Hello. With Emily Peck of Axios. Hi, hi. We have so much to talk about. Three, four big stories this week. We're just jamming this show full of them. We are going to talk about the big Department of Justice antitrust suit against Apple, which wiped $114 billion off the Apple stock valuation. We are going to talk about the Reddit IPO and possibly even next week's listing of Truth Social. We are going to talk about the National Association of Realtors and the way that buyers commissions are now up in the air and questions the what happens to the entire real estate broker industry. We're going to talk about that. We have a Slate Plus segment about Ben and Jerry's and ice cream and the business of ice cream. It's all coming up on Slate Money. Hey there, Slate Money listeners. Before we start the show, I want to let you know about a story coming up a little later. It's from one of our partners, SAP. AI comes at you fast, and if you don't get reliable and relevant advice, your business might miss out. Whether you're looking to automate tasks or embed AI in your business processes, SAP can help. To learn more, head to sap.com slash AI and stick around for expert advice on how to embrace AI with confidence. This episode is brought to you by Splunk. You need to keep operations humming around the clock, but potential disruptions are everywhere. Splunk helps you predict problems and find and fix issues fast, so you can reduce risk and ditch downtime. The world's largest enterprises rely on Splunk's unified security and observability platform to become more efficient, resilient, and innovative. With Splunk, you can react quickly, evolve faster, and be ready for anything. Stay ahead of disruptions. Learn more at splunk.com slash resilience. Okay, so let's start with the big news, which is that the biggest company in the world, Apple, is worth $2.7 trillion or something like that. Shocker turns out to be a monopoly, according to the DOJ, which I'm just going to come out and say that, duh. Like, of course it's a monopoly. <laughs> you don't get to be worth $3 trillion without having monopolistic characteristics. Like, this is kind of obvious. It is not necessarily something that the DOJ will easily be able to persuade a judge of. And the one thing we can be sure about is that this antitrust lawsuit is going to drag on for, you know, a decade. But like the big picture, Emily, is, yeah, they have a whole shit ton of monopolistic things that they do. Yeah. And I'm here and, and Elizabeth will get in the details of the suit. But I'm here to defend the Apple monopoly. I think it is good and it serves anyone with an iPhone or a MacBook or AirPods even very well. They're the only tech company that I interact with that is easy. It makes it, they make it easy for me to use their products. I don't have to devote any mental energy to understanding how an Apple product works or how to set it up the way I do with so many other things that I buy where, you know, you buy some new cool thing, like we just bought a new scale. It's like a Garmin scale. And it just sat around, you know, in the box for a couple of weeks because it was like, who wants to figure out how this dumb thing works? But, But okay, but this is the point of the lawsuit, right? Is that Apple deliberately makes you buy Apple products because it makes it easier to incorporate them into your personal ecosystem and deliberately makes it hard for you to buy Garmin products and makes it much harder for Garmin to just plug into the system than its own, say, Apple Watch. Yes, they make it, they make you want to buy their products. I mean, not to be all Republican over here, but like, since when is that a bad thing? Like, oh no, the company makes their products really good, so you want to buy them? Well, no, but they're also making, they're also <laughs> making, like, let's, let, let, no, let's dive into this because this is a good one, right? Because Garmin competes directly with the Apple Watch. You're a runner. You, mm-hmm. you know this very well. Mm-hmm. Runners love to have watches that, you know, tell them how fast they're running and all of that. I got my Garmin right here. I have a Garmin oh, too. Oh, nice. You have a Garmin on your wrist. And the Garmin, as you, a test doesn't plug and play seamlessly with the Apple ecosystem in the way that the Apple Watch does, which means that Garmin has to struggle to compete with the Apple Apple Watch. It needs to be really, really better than Apple Watch in various many ways, including on price, in order for 
runners like yourself to choose the Garmin over the Apple Watch. And is that really fair? Well, this is the the essence of the DOJ suit is kind of an inversion of what Emily's saying. She's saying we all love the Apple ecosystem because it. it's great and the products are great and it's easy to integrate everything. The DOJ is alleging that Apple isn't actually making higher quality products on a regular basis. They're making it everybody else's products shitty by just locking them out of the ecosystem and doing things that the Department of Justice regards as anti-competitive. But that's a sabotaging <laughs> everyone else. Yes. Basically. Right. Yes. They're not they make because ev- they've made everyone else look bad, they look good by default. But I'm just being duped and they're just <laughs> Well, yeah, exactly. Like when when you pay money in an app or for an app, you don't think to yourself, well, obviously Apple is getting 30 cents on every dollar that I'm paying. But Apple, you know, when they're serving you up their apps, they don't need to spend, you know, 30% of their money. I mean, they can pay it to themselves, Mm -hmm. I guess, but it doesn't matter. It's all their money, right? And so, like, that gives them, like, an inbuilt 30% advantage over any third-party app provider. And it's not like Android is bad. It's just that Android doesn't work well with iPhone. So you have the green text bubble. And this is the suit's Elizabeth, is this suit all about the green versus blue text bubbles? No, it's, it's all about many things. It. Yeah, but that <laughs> is definitely part of it. That's a part of it. It's it's a lot of Apple products have built in mechanisms that make it difficult to use them with other products. So if you have an Apple Watch, you can't use it unless you have an iPhone. For what you just mentioned, Garmin doesn't really integrate very well with the Apple systems. But the thing is, if you're a third party developer. You have to be in the Apple ecosystem. There's there's sort of no way to get around it. And so you end up, unless you're a very big, you know, app developer, you you really don't have a choice. And so the the only company that I can think of that really does an end run around it is Amazon. Because if you own a Kindle, you can't, for instance, buy a ebook in the app on an iPhone, but that's because Amazon doesn't want to pay those fees to Apple. But if you're a third-party developer for almost anything else, you don't have a choice because your apps have to be in the App Store. And just to, to, to Elizabeth's point, the user experience of using Amazon is just much worse than it should be and it needs to be if you're using Apple devices, right? So I have an Apple TV. I just wanted to buy the TV series Wolf Hall on Amazon, right? Because I wanted to watch Wolf Hall as Mark Rylance. He's awesome, right? And normally, in any sensible world, I would just open up the Amazon app on my Apple TV and click buy, and then I could watch it immediately. But because of exactly what Elizabeth was talking about, instead what I need to do is go onto the Amazon website buy it on the Amazon website, and then open the Apple TV and see that it's there. Because if you bought it in within Apple TV, Apple would take 30% of the amount that I was paying for that TV show. And it's kind of silly that they would have to do that. They would do that. Yeah. The whole thing is, is awkward and monopolistic. Well, it also, it's not great for users all the time, because it was, with third party developers who need to put their app in the app store, there are things that Apple won't let them do, including linking back to things like support pages if the support pages indicate that you can also download the app on via web browser and not have to pay the fee to Apple. This happened with Tony Hale, who started Chartbeat and Scroll mentioned that they had a problem with that because people needed a lot of different ways to you know download the Scroll app. And there was no way on the app page to really redirect customers to support links. And that's, that's a you know, user hostile feature, but it protects Apple and in, in that it forces people to use the ecosystem and not just go to the web. I mean, it's clearly harmful for third party developers and companies. The, the, the harm to consumers seems, it just seems really small ball to me. It just doesn't seem. So Emily, let me, let me put it this way. You and I are deeply embedded in the Apple ecosystem. Um, you know, I shudder every time I need to use Windows or Microsoft Teams. And I'm like, Ugh. so like, I am with you as part of like, I like using Apple products. I have multiple Apple computers. I have an iPhone and all of this kind of stuff. And they all work seamlessly together. And that's great. But think about it this way. When I need a new computer, I am going to buy a Mac. There is zero probability that I will buy anything that is not a Mac. For that reason, 
other computer manufacturers can't really compete on price and say like you can buy my computer it's much cheaper i'm like i don't care if it's cheaper it's not a mac i need to have a mac so and apple's profit margins on macs are enormous right so i wind up paying three times more than it costs to make the computer for the computer just because it's an apple so that is a clear and obvious consumer harm i'm basically spending fifteen hundred dollars for a five hundred dollar computer and so I'm out a thousand bucks. That is economically a consumer harm. It is costing me too much money to buy my computer. Do you not see that? No. You can choose to buy a different you can spend four hundred dollars and buy a PC. It's your that's your choice. It's like isn't it like you saying, I will only buy a BMW. I those are the best cars and that's the car I want to drive. And I'm that's what I'm gonna buy every time and it's costing me so much money. Like, yeah. That's your choice. Well, the core of the lawsuit, <laughs> though, is unfair competition. And granted, that's, you know, that can be a very big gray area. But if consumer choice is reduced because the Apple ecosystem is as close as it is, then, you know, that that's really what the lawsuit is speaking to. So, of course, you still have a choice, but it's sort of like I have a choice about which cable provider I can choose and I have two options. <laughs> <laughs> Right. No, I mean, I understand what the DOJ is doing in their case. It's just of all and, – and Apple is what? The fourth big tech company the DOJ is now going after? Yeah, it's going all. after all of them. It's been yeah. going after Apple, uh, Amazon, and Google. And- the Meta is facing a suit from FTC, but I mean, it's like the same thing. They're all facing these these suits. And I, I feel of the four, this one is – it's go- it's not going down easy for me. I understand that Apple tightly controls its ecosystem – and has all these rules in place that make it really hard to compete with them. And and yeah, and that does seem, that is a monopoly. And um, there is a case here. It just doesn't feel like when you argue harm to consumers, it's a little, I think I'm not the only Apple person out there that's kind of like, oh, whatever. You know, it's fine. Well, but you know? that's because you you are embedded in the ecosystem so thoroughly that it doesn't affect you you've got you've got stockholm syndrome emily perhaps but here's the question right is is that like if emily peck doesn't mind apple being a monopoly that doesn't make apple's monopoly (laughs) any less illegal sure sure and Um, and so like what you're talking about (laughs) is the consumer harm part of it right and like you're kind of conceding the illegal monopoly part of it and then saying well the consumer harm is low so one possible outcome to this case is that the judge agrees with the DOJ that Apple is a monopoly and and then it also agrees with Emily that the consumer harm is low and therefore comes out with a judgment where the remedy is relatively benign and light because the judge basically says, eh, you know, yes, it's a monopoly, but it's not a particularly harmful monopoly and therefore I won't force Apple to do a whole bunch of like, you know, massive divestments or whatever in order to right yeah you break up apple like that's not a good idea Yeah. plus in general (laughs) like and this is one of the weaknesses of the suit is that it's just not obvious what the doj is is asking for it's a very broad and sort of kind of flabby and not particularly well written suit and there's chunks of it like the bit about apple carplay that are just basically wrong and they seem to just be throwing everything into a blender and saying, well, something in here is going to like catch the eye of the judge and might happen. But I would have preferred, you know, something a little bit more targeted, you know, about like the app store fees or something and just and, and be very specific about what you're alleging, what the what the harms are and what the remedy is. Because right now, all that's going to happen is that there's going to be a massive court case, which is going to drag on forever. And at the end, no one's going to be particularly satisfied. And I don't see how that benefits anyone. Well, let's carve out a little piece of it. Let's talk about the green bubble problem that Emily alluded to. If, yeah, you, if you're on an Android phone, you know, your your messages show up as green bubbles instead of blue bubbles because you're not in the iMessage system. So the iMessage system doesn't allow for third-party messaging systems to just use SMS by default if you you're not speaking to somebody who is already on the iMessaging system. Like you can fiddle with your settings, you can So so to be clear, like what you're saying here, and this is this is really important, is that if you want to receive a text message in a messaging app on an iPhone, 
you are basically forced to use Apple's iMessage app. That's the difference. There are like yeah. there are horrible hacks where you can basically wind up using Signal, and I've tried to do it, and it's a shit show. But like ninety nine point nine percent of iPhone users wind up using iMessage for their SMS messaging because trying to use anything else for an SMS messaging on an iPhone is just really borderline impossible. It's incredibly difficult, and Apple deliberately makes it incredibly difficult. And so, therefore, if you are a third-party app developer who makes a much better messaging app, and God knows there's lots of messaging apps out there, including Signal, your ability to get any market share among iPhone users is non-existent. And so, and given that messaging apps have this whole network effect where everyone is constantly messaging everyone else, you know, like what that means is that you're never going to get any scale. But wait, I thought we were talking about um, the problem that arises when you, an Apple person, tries to talk to some someone who is an Android person. So there are two different things here. One is within iMessage the experience of communicating over SMS rather than communicating over Apple's proprietary iMessage system is like is degraded and they get the green bubble and there's less security and all the rest of it. And so there is that kind of pressure on people to not be the party pooper with the green bubble. And so, yeah, within iMessage, there is that like, the way they make the non-iPhone users feel like outsidery, terrible people. But in a weird way, that's less bad than the bigger picture, which is that this is a phone with SMS functionality built in, like all phones have SMS functionality built in. But your choice in the matter of which app do you use to send and receive SMS messages is basically no choice at all. If you have Mm -hmm. an iPhone, you're always going to use the built-in Apple app and that's there's no reason why that should be the case. Yeah, I don't care about that. Well, <laughs> you sound like, you know, Tim Cook famously said to someone who said, well, Apple's, you know, extremely expensive. And, you know, my mother-in-law or somebody can't use messaging properly because they can't download certain video clips, whatever. And Tim Cook said, well, you should just get your mother-in-law an iPhone. <laughs> but the thing is iPhones are still fucking expensive and a lot of people, That's you know, true. a phone now is a utility for people. You you basically cannot exist in society without some kind of phone. And you know, texting, using web browsers, that's it's a lot of us have to use those things for work. So the consumer harm is really, you know, you're putting the the floor on owning a smartphone that's actually functional and does what it's supposed to at a much higher level than, you know, is is good for consumers generally. So I just had an interesting meeting with the CEO of Back Market, which is a place where you can buy and sell secondhand iPhones and other electronics. And one of the first things I asked him is, you know, and there's all manner of computers and everything else on there. And I asked him, well, how much of your business is iPhones, just iPhones? It's like half. Half of their entire business is just iPhones. And that speaks to the incredible demand out there in the world for people who really want an iPhone but feel very unable to pay full price for a new iPhone. And so they wind up having to get the second hand one, which is, you know, it's good. Like we want iPhones to have a longer life and to, you know, be, for their, to for people to be able to reuse them and refurbish them and that kind of thing. But it is, it does kind of speak to the fact that, you know, there's a huge number of people out there who really cannot find their way to paying the brand new price of an iPhone. So they wind up getting old ones or secondhand ones or, you know, whatever. The fact is, this is a duopoly, right? And one of the things that is confusing about the term monopoly is that people think, people look at that mono prefix and they're like, you're not a monopoly if there's two companies competing. It's like, yes, you are, right? Uh, uh, If you're one member of a duopoly then you are a monopoly both members of a duopoly are monopolies and so yes it is absolutely true that apple is a monopoly and it's also absolutely true that android is a monopoly and no one else has a look in right and that is bad you have a world where if you want to run an a phone operating system 
or you know, if you're a phone manufacturer and you want to put an operating system on your phone, you only have one choice, right? Which is Android, because there's the duopoly here, and Android and Apple won't let third party phone makers put iOS on their phones. Like, do you remember when, God, like 20 years ago, there was this whole thing in Apple clones, they were called, where anyone could make PCs running like System 7 or whatever the, the Macintosh OS was at the time. And so, and that was like, you know, that's great. Anyone can make a PC, they can load it up with Mac OS, and then like everyone can compete to make the cheapest computers running Mac OS, a bit like anyone can compete to make the cheapest computers running Windows. The fact is that there is a world out there where Apple would allow anyone to make phones and install iOS on them. That is not the world we live in, but it would be a more competitive, more consumer friendly world. But would, the iPhone be worse then? I don't, maybe. <laughs> maybe, maybe it would. And, and maybe you're right. Like, I, I think I think that two things can be true. I think that there can be consumer harms to a monopoly and there can be consumer benefits to a monopoly. Yeah. Yeah. And you're saying there are consumer benefits, but that doesn't mean there aren't consumer harms and that doesn't mean a monopoly isn't illegal. I agree. And at the end of the day, I still support Apple's monopoly. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you for coming to my table. You voted with your money already, so... <laughs> Stephen Jobs is a 27-year-old multimillionaire. So life is already seducing you into learning this stuff. And it's certainly not an 1984-ish vision at all. It's just going to be very gradual, and then we'll seduce you into learning how to use it. Hello, listeners. Are you enjoying today's episode? We have more of it for you in Slate Plus. This week, we're talking about one of my favorite topics, which is ice cream. Unilever is selling its ice cream business. So we really dig into why it would want to sell such a delicious product and, you know, the state of ice cream in 2024. So if you're a Slate Plus member, you'll get to hear that at the end of the show. And if you're not a Slate Plus member and you don't want to hear ads right now and you want a bunch of other good Slate stuff, you should probably sign up for Slate Plus because with Slate Plus, you get ad-free listening on all Slate podcasts. You get unlimited access to all the Slate content, and we love the Slate content. And of course, you get access to Slate Money bonus segments every week where in the cone of Slate Plus, we really get into things, and you really don't want to miss that. So sign up at slate.com slash plus. That's slate.com slash plus. Slate Money is sponsored this week by Mint Mobile. Mint Mobile ditched retail stores and all those overhead costs and instead sells their phone plans online, passing those savings on to you. For a limited time, they're passing on even more savings with a new customer offer that cuts all Mint Mobile plans to $15 a month when you purchase a three-month plan. That's unlimited talk, text, and data for $15 a month. Mint Mobile will rescue you with premium wireless plans. All plans come with high-speed data, unlimited talk, unlimited texts on the nation's largest 5G network. To get this new customer offer and your new three-month unlimited wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month, go to mintmobile.com slash slate money. That's mintmobile.com slash slate money. Cut your wireless bill to $15 a month at mintmobile.com slash slate money. $45 upfront payment required equivalent to $15 a month. Available to new customers on first three-month plan only. Speeds can be slower, above 50 gigabytes on the unlimited plan. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. When it comes to your finances, go for the credit card that's always there for you. With 24-7 U.S.-based live customer service from Discover, everyone has the option to talk to a real person anytime, day or night. Yep, that means no more waiting for, quote, normal business hours just to get a hold of someone. We're talking real service from real people whenever you need it. Get the customer service you deserve with Discover. Limitations apply. See terms at discover.com slash credit card. Shall we talk about Reddit? Because that was the big IPO of the week. Reddit is now worth roughly a gazillion dollars, like $10 billion, something like that. Which is kind of crazy because let's just get one thing out very early. 
Reddit is 19 years old. It is a very, very mature company. It is not in any sense a startup. And out of those 19 years, the number of years in which it has managed to make a profit is zero. How does a 19-year-old company that has never made a profit, how does that wind up being worth $10 billion? Uh, you tell me. <laughs> $10 billion was its valuation in 2021, which is like the frothiest year ever for, for fundraising and things like this. And it's surprising to me that its valuation now that it is also $10 billion. I don't actually understand it. I think it has to do with how big Reddit's user base is. It's something like it's is like, it like 500 400 million, million uniques a month. 500 million uniques a month, really devoted, really devoted users. And then the new hot thing that they're talking about now is its AI potential. But I don't understand that either because it seems like, so people are excited about Reddit's content to, to train AI basically because it you know has like 19 years of content of humans interacting, which by the way is scary that this is the stuff that trains AI, but nevertheless, that's valuable to sell to AI companies to train AIs. But once it's sold, like that, it doesn't seem that valuable to me. Like that stuff is all over the internet. I agree that like the corpus is the most valuable thing. And once you've trained your AI on the corpus, you don't need to tra train your AI on the corpus again. Like it's, it's already trained. There is real value in the new material that is appearing on Reddit every day because you want your AI to be up to date. But like how much value there is in that extra marginal new material, I don't know. And I don't think you can get to a $10 billion valuation with that. I also think, I think the valuation is primarily based on the size of the audience because there's especially, you know, we're in an environment where you're seeing a lot of digital media companies implode that did have fairly large reach numbers. And now I think the... What is the case? What What, what is the case that like even though we haven't been able to figure it out over the past 19 years, that we obviously now we've worked it out and we can figure it out. Well, I think the assumption is that if you have the customers there, you can figure out how to monetize them in ways that maybe, you know, didn't work 10 years ago or this year. I don't think that they've really suggested that they have a solution to it yet. But and I think that AI stuff is a little bit of a red herring. I think any media company that says they're going to incorporate AI right now gets a little bit of interest from the market that may or may not be justified. And the use cases that they've talked about really have to do with things like moderation, not so much you know, selling the corpus of data, although that is a potential revenue stream. No, but so this is, this is the question, right? We have all lived through the era of the internet where people were like i'm going to get to scale and then once you get to scale the money just automatically arrives i remember you know ev williams telling me that about medium back in the day he's like so long, i'm not worried about how i'm going to make money because anyone who gets big enough just makes money and ben smith wrote a really good book about this that like we did that and we built a whole bunch of things that did get big and didn't make money and then we learned that size on its own does not suffice. And so then we are now in like the downswing of like, well, I don't care if you're big, show me how you're making money. And now that we're on that but downswing, my question for you is, that is a, you know, like your like underpants gnomes theory of Reddit, where like first get scale, second question mark, three profit. Like where, where, what's no, the no, question? No, no. There, there are two things that make this different from uh, the stuff that you're talking about. One is that I think a lot of people conflate traffic with audience. They think it's the same thing and it's not. Audience are people who come back to your property or your, you know, whatever your business is because they actually care about it. They feel like they have a community there. You can game traffic. You can pay for traffic. That's not the same as having audience. And then the other thing is the reach, the, the underpants and home theory, as you, as you call it, was really based on a business model that was really about display advertising and you know programmatic display specifically. And so that over time has just become incredibly degraded and the price that people are paying for advertising keeps cranking down. But those that's not the only potential revenue stream for Reddit or any company that has a return audience. So I, there are a lot of media companies that are wrestling with this right now too. I, I totally understand that it has audience and not traffic. I totally understand that um, it has a large audience that is very hard to replicate. And so it, it has, it, it is somewhat unique in that respect. 
What I don't understand, and the reason I call this an underpants limb company, is this: the question mark is still there. Like, if the way you monetize the audience isn't advertising, what is it? Well, so Reddit offers an opportunity for pretty deep market segmentation if they decide to go that route, because these interest communities are very niche in a lot of cases, and some of them are very valuable. I don't think you have to monetize all of Reddit's audiences, but I think you can cherry pick some and sell them things, not just by advertising, uh, and, and also create you know more close community where people are paying membership fees which sometimes these communities do informally anyway, and they, they figure out another way outside of the ecosystem to monetize it. So, I, I mean, I feel like we're reinventing Reddit gold here, which was like 10 years ago. They're like, membership fees. That's, that's not what I'm suggesting, because what, what people were paying for Reddit gold was just to be up-modded in the community. Uh, and, and that's not really what I'm talking about. That's, that's more like paying for better access to you know, the moderation aspects of the site. So you're just talking about subscriptions to some subreddits? Well, not just something? subscriptions. You know, if you have a captive audience and they have demonstrable interest in a very specific subject, you can sell them endemic things around that. That's why, you know, almost every general interest paper or magazine has an auto column, even though people aren't really clamoring for it because you can do events and, you know, do advertising campaigns around specific things if you have a audience that is telling you they want it. But here's, here's my question, Elizabeth, which is that Reddit's audience is very large at 500 million, but it isn't growing. It's been basically stuck at 500 million for years. The size of the subreddits and the depth of the subreddits and the variety and the nichiness and the attraction to marketers, that's all been there for years. None of this is new. And yet, they haven't managed to turn a profit in the previous five, six, however many years it's been since they've been big. What you're talking about is like, in theory, they could. But if they could in the future, why haven't they been able to in the past? Because the path of least resistance is low quality, shitty display ads. And so, and that's when everybody else in the same market is doing exactly that. It, you're going to be very hard pressed to find executives who want to try other revenue models. It's just not going to happen. And then, you know, right now, Reddit's part owner was Condé Nast. And Condé Nast's entire attitude toward digital for a long time was that the only point of owning digital properties was to drive subscriptions to the print magazines. So they weren't exactly a hotbed of people looking for new business models that would make it sustainable. But I do think as a public company, they're going to have more incentive to do that. You have to wonder, I mean, when you think about it, the closest company to a Reddit is like Facebook. And Facebook, you know, people come back to it, they share stuff there, and they're a profit making, money making machine. Like, I guess there's no reason Reddit couldn't be the same machine. It's the same thing. People go there every day to share stuff. Why couldn't Reddit just? Well, also, the Facebook groups are really powerful. The, you know, that's, I know a lot of people who would be off Facebook if they didn't have one or two groups that were important, particularly, you know, neighborhood groups, parenting groups. Yeah, stuff for like sure. That. Yeah. I, I have, I go to Facebook because it's the only way I could find out what's going on at like my kids' schools and in my town because there's no local news that makes, that's, that's valuable to me online. What, one interesting thing about Facebook, though, and I think this is, this has been said by the folks at Facebook, is that Facebook, you know, is incredibly expensive to run. And we're seeing this at Reddit. Like, the, the, the amount that Reddit spends on R&D is very large by Reddit standards, but it's tiny by Facebook standards. Hmm. Facebook is expensive to run, and they're basically saying, if we had 500 million users, we would lose money. If we were basically an Anglophone website slash app, we would lose money. Like the reason why Facebook makes money is because it's managed to expand globally and become something genuinely international. Because the United States and the rest of the Anglosphere isn't a big enough market to make the economies of scale work. Oh, and that's problematic for Reddit because they're not succeeding in being a global site, from what I understand. They're just so English focused. Well, Facebook also just has way higher costs. I mean, the functionality that Facebook has, you know, is is gargantuan compared to the things that you can do on Reddit. So it costs them a lot more to operate the business because they're not just operating Facebook groups. Right. And mm -hmm. and Reddit also has volunteer moderators, which 
Facebook doesn't have, and that helps Reddit. There's two other things we should mention. One is, as Elizabeth alluded to, um, the big winner in this IPO is Condé Nast, the old-fashioned media company, because they bought Reddit a million years ago for like ten pounds, and then now, like they're they're making loads of money. Well done, Condé. Like you, ten million in two thousand six, exactly. Now they're making billions, I think, and they're making right? one one point six billion. And the other big winner in terms of like massive shareholder is none other than our very own Sam Altman, who somehow managed to accumulate a massive shareholding and is now making like half a billion dollars from this IPO. He's really crushing it lately, this kid. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing we should mention, because it is the business and finance news of ne- next week, is that this is not the only social media company that's going to get like a high profile new listing. Reddit happened on Thursday. And then next week, it's going to be Trump Media and Technology Group is finally going to be a listed public company. And it too is going to have a multi-billion dollar valuation. And somehow I'm going to come out and say that the bullishness that Elizabeth Spires evinces when it comes to Reddit is not going to be matched with similar bullishness for Truth Social. Yes, well, that's because I've been on Truth Social, <laughs> and it's terrible. But I also, you know, the it'll be interesting to see what happens with the stock. Trump is locked up for six months, so it's not going to help him with his Monday deadline for coming up with close to five hundred million dollars. Yeah, you see, I'm not sure that's true. It is true right now that he's locked up for six months, but also he's Trump, and to all intents and purposes, he is the person who is Truth Social. Without him, Truth Social is nothing. So if Trump goes up to the CEO of Truth Social and says, release me from my lockup, you think they're going to say no? No, they're going to say yes. But who's going to buy if if he's selling all of his shares? I mean, it is possible that the share price will go down if he tries to sell $400 million of shares. But like, if this thing has a $5 billion valuation... Maybe it won't. Maybe he will be able to sell $400 million of shares and make $400 million that way. We'll see. (laughs) When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn isn't just another job board. It has a vast network of more than a billion professionals, which makes it the best place to hire. It gives you access to professionals you can't find anywhere else. And it does all that while making the process easy and intuitive. Hiring is easy when you have that many quality candidates. So easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. They even just launched a feature that helps you write job descriptions, making the process even easier and quicker. 2.5 million small businesses use LinkedIn for hiring. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash slate. That's linkedin.com slash slate to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. This podcast is brought to you by Slate Studios and SAP. AI is moving so fast. If you don't get reliable and relevant advice, your business might miss out. Welcome to Dear Artie, an advice column from SAP, where we tackle the tricky questions at the intersection of AI and business. Here's our expert, the technology futurist, Ian Kahn. Hi, I'm excited to dive into today's question. Dear Artie, as our company expands, so do our hiring efforts. How can AI help us attract top talent? Signed, Searching for Higher Power. So, Searching for Higher Power, one of the most daunting undertakings of an HR leader today is building a new team and finding and vetting new talent. This is a very time-consuming process and can take precious organizational resources. As a companion to the HR team, AI technology can be used to create job descriptions, analyze candidate resumes, and filter candidates into various pools based on experience, skills, or any other parameter. You can also use AI to match internal talent with positions available. Parameters for this can be set, rules can be set, that can all be done through the algorithm. There are so many things that we as humans could be not looking at that AI can do in a matter of seconds. 
Embrace AI with confidence. Head to sap.com slash AI to learn more. Slate Money is sponsored this week by Shopify. If you're selling a little or a lot, Shopify helps you do your thing. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business from launching the online shop to opening up a real life store to, oh my God, I just hit a million orders. Shopify is there to help you grow and grow and just keep on growing. You're selling soap, you're selling outdoor outfits, you're selling cast iron skillets. It doesn't matter. Shopify helps you sell everywhere. They have an all-in-one e-commerce platform. They have an in-person point of sale system. Wherever, whatever you're selling, Shopify has you covered and they have award-winning help to support your success every step of the way. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash money, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash money now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash money. We should move on and talk about real estate because this is Emily's favorite subject. I love this subject. Yes. We teased this last week. We said it was coming and now it is here. The big settlement between the National Association of Realtors and a bunch of like plaintiffs in the class action suit. Yeah. So so last week, this big settlement dropped. The National Association of Realtors, the big industry group, said it would settle this case, a class action filed by home sellers, Burnett v. NAR. It was a Missouri class action, one of about 20 class action suits filed against the National Association of Realtors. And they lost that big time in October. It was like a $1.8 billion verdict in October. And there was a possibility that verdict could be trebled. So they could wind up paying more than $5 billion. So last Friday, they said, forget it, we'll settle. They said, we'll settle for $418 million, which I'm not great at math, but I know is a lot less than $5 billion. Well, um, it's less than $1.8 billion. Like, and less what than $1.8 billion. What, what was the incentive for the people who won the case for $1.8 billion to settle for $400 million? NAR doesn't have $1.8 billion. Like They would never have gotten the money. But the more important part of the settlement was the realtors agreed to change the rules around commissions. And the rules around commissions are like annoying to, to explain and sometimes like your brain will lock up when you're thinking about it. But basically, when you list your house for sale, you have to say that you're going to pay a commission to the agent who represents the buyer of the house. So someone comes to buy your house, pays the money to buy your house, and you, the seller, are the one paying their real estate agent. And the argument in the case was that creates all kinds of mixed up incentives in the market where the buyer agent is kind of not beholden to his or her client, the buyer, but the seller actually. And one issue is like, if the seller doesn't promise a commission, no one will go show their house. They have to promise this commission. It's this thing called steering, which agents all say they don't do. But of course they do that if, if a house doesn't have a juicy commission, then they just won't, it won't get shown to clients. This I feel is, is less of an issue in the age of the internet where people generally find houses to look at themselves. But it's still, the conflict is still there. Like, just intuitively speaking, if you're hiring a buyer's agent who gets paid as a percentage of the sale, then the buyer's agent is incentivized to maximize the sale price, which is not what you want your agent to do. You want your agent to minimize the sale price. No. And the other thing is, and we should probably say this, like, my inbox is filling up with like real estate agents who are like, what you're saying isn't true. We would never steer a buyer, you know, based on commission rates. Sometimes I don't even know what the commission rate is. And this is just dishonest reporting. And it's just not true. But the fact is, if you're an agent for a buyer, and you know that the commission on some house is 0%, why would you waste your time? You would get paid no money to do that. It just... I, I think there are a lot of good agents out there and they and they don't feel like they're doing any steering at all. It's just they're accustomed to getting commissions and the way the market works is there really aren't a lot of like sellers not offering them. The NAR will say, well, you can offer whatever commission you want. We don't set the commission. There's no standard commission. Does anyone ever do that? Does anyone ever offer 0% commissions? I mean, 
Interestingly, I guess, if we're down this rabbit hole, if you buy a new home, you might not even use a buyer agent at all. You might just like 30%, I think, of new home sales. It's just that the home builder has like someone sell you the house and right. you're just a buyer and there's no buyer agent at all. So yeah, there's no there's no commission for the buyer agent in that case. They're not even used. So that was the big news, this big settlement. And it's really freaked out the real estate industry, they're really worried because now the question is, so the settlement said that now in the MLS, the listing service that realtors use to find out what houses are for sale, you can no longer promise buyer agents commissions. The settlement doesn't say you can't pay a buyer agent a commission. Like You could still negotiate that off the MLS. So a lot of people are like, it's going to be fine. Like buyer agents will still get commissions. It's not as bad as it sounds. It doesn't go far enough. Da, 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 da. But judging by the general freak out in the industry, it seems like something has gone down here that that is a volcano eruption in the real estate market. And and to be clear, there are way too many real estate brokers in America. Like there's 1.6 million who are licensed with the NAR, and there's probably another million on top of that who aren't. And a huge number of them are just not very good. And probably most of them haven't even bought or sold a house in the past, like, you know, two or three years. It's, you know, like they're just sitting around not actually making any money at all. And this is not a profession in any normal sense, right? There's a small number of high volume, highly paid agents, but most of them, you know, are struggling to make ends meet. It's, it's not a good, nice thing. Thing. And if this really does sort of come in like a bomb and take out a lot of the people who are barely making any money doing this anyway and makes it much more professional, that's good. And then just more broadly, if the cost of buying and selling homes comes down from like the crazy price that it costs right now to something much more in line with international norms, that's also good. There's no reason why the why the middlemen should make 6% on this because like that's more than double what everyone else gets paid on the rest of the planet. Well, I think one of the critiques, and I'm not sure I buy this critique, is that for tightly budgeted first-time home buyers, if the model switches to them having to pay out of pocket for a buyer's agent, the, the cost, you know, overall absolute costs go up for them. Yeah, that's definitely one of the big critiques. Like, who's going to pay for the first-time buyers or people who are more strapped for cash? Like, now they have to what pay, pay a flat fee to a broker or something like that. Um, it's not so easy to fold in the fee to your mortgage. But this can this can be solved with a relatively simple piece of legislation. You know, yes. allow allow people to capitalize the broker's fee. Boom, it's done. Yes. And also, like I said, like you can still get the seller to pay that fee as part of concessions. Although that could be a reason this this settlement for all the for all the talk about it doesn't go through because the DOJ decides, well, that's still that still doesn't solve the problem that we've been worried about and pushing the industry on this whole time. Well, I read a, I read a really good piece on Axios.com by the, about this. It was written by this super smart person called Emily Peck. <laughs> and what she said, and you may or may not agree with this, is that the whole <laughs> settlement was basically put together in the shadow of the DOJ and what the DOJ wanted. And this is like, and even though the DOJ wasn't a party to the suit, it kind of was a party to the suit. Yeah, it's really interesting. The Department of Justice has been going after the real estate industry for like almost a hundred years. And like, so, I mean, that just puts that Apple conversation in perspective, if you think <laughs> about it. Um, and they've made like a little bit of headway here or there. The only reason we have like Zillow and Redfin or we have online listings now is because the DOJ went after the industry. They didn't even want to open up their MLS to have the discount brokers pull listings from it, but they were forced to. So now we have that, but they, that, that settlement didn't even go far enough. So they, they had tried to sue over the cooperative compensation rule um, under the Trump administration. They announced a lawsuit and a settlement at the same time, blah, blah, blah. The Biden administration came in. They wanted to op open back up the investigation against the NAR. Then they wanted to stop the settlement that the Trump administration, DOJ, had negotiated. Um, that's all like tied up in court. So they weren't really able to make headway. But meanwhile, there are all these class actions happening. And in the background, the DOJ is like watching this really, really carefully. And like, I don't know if they were rooting for the plaintiff's attorneys, but 
I, I really don't know, but maybe. Um, there's this other case in Massachusetts where there was kind of this settlement that would have done not enough to end this cooperative compensation rule. So the DOJ stepped in in February and said, this settlement, and it was a case very similar to the, the $1.8 billion case, the Missouri case, they said, this settlement doesn't go far enough. It doesn't solve any of the problems. Like we need, we need a settlement that goes much further. And that was in February. And I mean, it really looks to me like the writing was on the wall from that settlement. The NAR saw it and was like, okay, well, we're going to have to go farther in our settlement. And yeah, that's kind of how that's kind of how the government uh, wielded its influence behind the scenes here. And and they should because these are antitrust cases. And anytime there's an antitrust case, you know, the DOJ can, if it wants to, step in and you know say what they think and like intervene in that way. On which note, I think we should have a numbers round. My number this week is. $4.25 million. And that is the price of Len Meldy. Either of you want to guess what Len Meldy is? Is it is it a kind of cheese? <laughs> <laughs> it is not a cheese, Elizabeth. A rare wine. <laughs> well, that's a type of guess. concrete banana. <laughs> <laughs> um, Len Meldy is a gene therapy which right. is used to treat a genetic disease called metachromatic leukodystrophy. Oh, this is the most expensive drug in the world. And it is now the most expensive drug drug in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Four and a quarter million dollars, if you want to take Len Meldy. Who makes it? Orchard Therapeutics. How many people need it? It's a very rare disease. It's I a understand. rare disease. So um, there was a trial where they gave it to 37 children. So presumably the market is bigger than 37. But yeah, they're not going to be, it's not a mass market drug like Ozempic, Ozempic that we're going to talk about <laughs> in the plus. Yes. But before we get to the plus, Emily, what is your number? I was going to do something serious from the week, but then I decided not to. So my number is 1 billion-ish. Ish. I like I like ish numbers. <laughs> it's one billion ish, and that is the alleged net worth of. Did you ever wonder how much comedians could make? Jerry Seinfeld. Bloomberg is reporting on Friday morning that his net worth is now more than one billion dollars, and ish. they added up a bunch ish, and they <laughs> added up a bunch of stuff. You know, his Seinfeld syndication for his TV show, his Netflix streaming deal touring, et cetera. And then they have just like one comment from a Seinfeld rep who was like, we don't think this is right. So then I read <laughs> it and I'm like, well, is it right? It's so squishy. I don't I don't know if I believe this or not, but good for him, I guess. I, I think it all depends on all of those syndication revenues that he's been receiving over the decades. You know, did he put them into Bitcoin? No, I if know he did, that is the then, question. Then probably he's a billionaire by now. <laughs> it does say they just assume they analyze all those numbers and then they just assume his cash appreciates in line with like a world index an index that they picked, which makes me just when you think about all these these billionaire lists and indexes, it's like, oh right, we're just guessing. We should just phone up his private wealth manager or his family office and be like, so did you manage to ride that Apple boom? Did you manage <laughs> to ride the Bitcoin boom? Or did you put it all into, you know, Kodak stock and it went to zero? Who knows? Who knows? And I mean, it's a show about nothing, but there's a lot but, of money but, in that. Or, a lot or of maybe, money in nothing. Or maybe he lost it all. Like celebrities are famously bad at managing money. Look at look at Johnny Depp. Is that why he's in all these fragrance ads? Yeah, Johnny Depp is always desperate for money, even though he's earned a fortune. Right. Pirates of Caribbean 6. Elizabeth, what's your number? Uh, my number is 18,300, and that's pounds. And that's the amount of money a pub in London called the 411 made recently on what they're calling Wall Street Wednesdays. And this is where they have patrons. Basically, uh, the drink prices fluctuate over the night. And they pay based on whatever the the drink market says the drink is worth at the time, and then they the <laughs> periodically market? what? It's based on a uh, demand in the bar, and so uh, periodically the market crashes and someone blows an air horn, and people race to the bar to get their cheap drinks before the price goes up again. <laughs> and this is part of a, a, a you know s supposed trend of competitive socializing. Because now oh apparently God. people need to do other things when they go to the bar besides drink and talk to their friends. I remember a million years ago, there was an Italian restaurant 
in the plaza of the World Trade Center, that big windswept plaza, which you would walk across and was always a little bit desolate. But there was an Italian restaurant on the corner there. And they had this deal where they would like, if the Dow dropped that day, then they would lower their prices. It was this like weird gimmick. And so every so often I'd be like, I'd go, I'd go there with my friend on days that the Dow dropped because that was the only way we could afford to go there. See, but, the yeah. Dow does matter, Felix. Here you are, you're saying it doesn't, but there's your case for it mattering. <laughs> we have been talking about variable prices a lot on this show and how like no one knows what anything costs anymore because the prices move around all the time. You know, maybe or maybe not at Wendy's, we don't know. But this is just part of variable prices. You walk into the pub in London, you have no idea how much your pint is going to be. That seems does seem kind of fun. I don't know what's wrong with me today. I'm arguing for more expensive <laughs> products and drinks that I don't know how much they cost. It does seem kind of fun. So I think to reward you, Emily, for your bad takes this week, <laughs> hey. we are going to have a Slate Plus on ice cream, which is your favorite subject. Yay! Yay! So you get ice cream in the Slate Plus. Everyone else who's a Slate Plus member gets ice cream in the Slate Plus. If you're not a Slate Plus member, then thanks for listening. Thanks to Shana Roth and Jared Downing for producing. And we will be back on Saturday with another Slate Money. Join us today during the Jeep Celebration event. Right now, get 20% below MSRP for an average of 15178 under MSRP on the purchase of a 2023 Jeep Grand Cherokee Overland 4xe or Summit 4xe. Not compatible with lease offers or with any other consumer and set of offers. 15,178 average based on 20% below average MSRP from all 2023 Grand Cherokee Overland 4xE and Summit 4xE models and dealer stock. Residency restrictions apply. Take retail delivery from dealer stock by 4-1. Jeep is a registered trademark.